Load to Learn, making curriculum materials accessible. Hello, I'm EA Draffen and I've worked for many years with accessible technologies and in particular with those who have dyslexia and visual impairments or print impairments as we may call them nowadays. But I've also worked in schools and universities over the years and I've been looking at the hardware that has been used for reading recently and it's expanded enormously. We now have e-readers, tablets and even reading from our phones which we would never have done a few years ago. One of the problems is uh, making decisions, making choices, deciding whether an e-reader versus a tablet is better for your student and in which situation you're going to use that tablet or e-reader. And then you have to actually consider whether one choice of tablet will do everything. And there's been a lot of convergence, as that's the term they tend to use, with these sort of devices. But still in schools, we know our students are using iPods. We know they're using their mobile phones, but not necessarily for reading. We also know that our laptops are still being used as one of the main ways of providing digital texts. The hardware for e-readers has yet to be tried and tested in libraries, but it's beginning to appear in some schools and universities. And this particular piece of research has shown that it's going to expand enormously by the year 2016. If you're thinking, making decisions, making choices, think size as much as anything else. If you've tried to read from an iPad for any length of time, you'll know that that 680 grams can feel mighty heavy after a while. And you'll know that your mobile phone is never far from your hand and rarely feels heavy. But that Kindle or Sony reader, which is six to seven inches, is actually quite an ideal weight and can slip into a bag very easily. So we need to think size. We do need to think about what goes on an e-reader and then we need to think about how this experience is going to impact on our reading. And most e-readers only have one type of reading experience. It's black on a grey white background. It tends to be with three or four font sizes and it tends to offer sometimes different font styles. But that experience is of a book coming down with several pages that you can then turn very easily with the press of a button or the swipe of a finger. Most of the touch e-readers are not as easy to use as the touch tablets. But there are a huge variety of tablets and more coming onto the market now with Windows uh, entering the fray. We have our Androids, our iOSes and even some Linux types. So we're looking at this enormous array of 7 to 10 inch tablets which have got very different reading experiences depending on the applications that you've downloaded to read your books. The problem about that is that we haven't really evaluated them very seriously yet. So we have a collection from iBooks to Stanza to particular ones that have been made specially to take the DAISY format such as Vodlight, Blio, but even those don't necessarily have all the attributes that you want. For instance, there's many a time when the text-to-speech won't work and you can't understand why. It can be due to copyright, it can be due to the format. But often you are left wondering why this wonderful application that you have that has lots of accessibility features isn't making the most of them. So what about the thing that you're looking at? What makes a comfortable reading experience? Well, the research is beginning to show that e-ink in particular, that which is found on an e-reader such as the Sony, the Kindle, the Kobo, the Nook, that is much more comfortable on the eyes. It doesn't glare as much. Also, it doesn't use the battery as quickly as the iPad or other LCD screens, which have high resolution and a brilliant way of watching videos. So they offer the, the flexibility that you might not get on an e-reader. But be aware, your battery is not going to last the two weeks that your Kindle battery may last. 
it may last eight hours not guaranteed to be a good experience if you're on a long train journey and if you're watching a lot of videos it's even worse this is something that a lot of the augmentative communication uh, device people have had to think about because their students are not only using their tablets for reading they're also using them for speaking and this can have a huge impact on them so there is a website that has actually done some interesting uh, comparisons and this is a very small page and you can't really view it so we've chopped up the pages for you and you've got red blobs the red blobs circles are where there is the most suitability according to this sort of research but we're debating some of these and of course it's going to change over time so if you're looking at battery life they're saying that the e-reader is the best and I think on most occasions that's probably right you probably couldn't read that long on your laptop, your tablet, or even your smartphone. But there is a downside when it comes to the pictures that your student might wish to see in their book. And there's no two ways about it. The e-reader does not give a good experience with pictures. And that's a worry, in particular if you want colour, because the e-reader tends to use black on white or reverse colours. One of the loveliest things about the tablet and the laptop, of course, is that the books can become interactive. And your e-book that's interactive can offer a multimodal experience. And sometimes, for some children, that can be amazingly helpful. In particular, if you're looking at science subjects and you want to perhaps see a chemistry experiment as well as read about it. Display sizes have a huge impact. And in fact, reading speeds can also be affected by the amount of text that you can see and read. So your laptop and your e-reader, although they may appear to be the best, very often the tablet will also give you a good experience. Readability. Now that's a debatable topic. What is readability? It can be about content. In this case, it's about the sort of experience you're having with the contrast levels and with perhaps the glare, the dim, the type of screen you're using. So think about that in terms of the feel of your reading rather than actually the content. Colours, you'll notice it's spelt with a, uh, an ORS, it's an American programme this one or American website. Um, and what do we need to say about colour? Well, e-readers are coming into colour. We don't want to think about the fact that this research may be a little dodgy, but I have to say I have actually found some e-readers with colour and they're not very clear. Um, they're nothing like as good as the high resolution tablets. So the researchers will be correct about that. The other problem is with the variety of formats where they've given a sort of half hatch for your e-reader. I feel that the e-reader really does limit the amount of formats you can have you're looking at your basic ones like PDFs and Mobi and EPUB. You're not looking at the video that can help you. You're not looking so much at the different navigable texts such as EPUB 3 or DAISY. So you have got problems there from the accessibility point of view. Weight, well, we know there are issues there. We've already discussed that. Um, and I have to say, some of the laptops that I've seen recently, the little Toshibas, very thin, little Dells, very thin, no CDs in them or anything like that, but they are just as portable as your tablet and in some cases as your e-reader. There's certain Mac technologies that have got so thin now that they could well be tablets. Mobile connectivity, well, they've got a blank for the e-reader here, but we know they can do Wi-Fi. We know that the Amazon Kindle excels in the one-stop download of their books and the Sony as well. So I don't think that little circle should be blank. But the other problem we have is that the tablet very often negotiates a very difficult type of connectivity. And if you've got a mobile phone and a tablet, as you well know, there's double the cost. And that actually is an issue. So we need to be looking at the gateways that are supplied with our tablets, uh, Mac and iTunes, Android and Google, etc. Disk space, yes, there's no two ways about it. We can get 64 plus gigs on a tablet now, many more on a laptop and not quite so much on an e-reader. Okay, so now we're looking at disk space again at the top, but we're now looking at additional contents. Additional contents on the e-reader are few and far between. You may get the odd apps now, 
and so I think that will increase. But it's your tablet that has the most apps, especially with your Android and your iOS, iTunes apps. And your laptop, of course, you can have both options there. Suitable for consumer books versus suitable professional books? Well, we're looking at textbooks, and there's no two ways about it. Our textbooks, journals, are still far more available on our basic computers, rather than through the tablet gateways, or even less so on the e-readers. So that is something to be thinking about. We're going to just have another look at this idea of font styles and resizing, reverse colours and possible TTS. We have real concerns here about copyright issues and about the amount of changes that can be made to a particular format of a book. And on your e-readers it is very limiting and we know that Amazon and others have gone through courts and through other things in America that have made it very difficult for their schools to have e-readers across the curriculum because they don't comply with 508. That is the laws in the USA. The same is true here in the UK. We need to be very careful that we are not providing tablets that don't offer all the accessibility that should be available to our students. So where we've said possible TTS, we need to be aware that text-to-speech is an option that we need to look for for many of our students with dyslexia, visual impairments and blindness. It is important and sadly it's not always available. I think what is I think undoubtedly true is that the tablet still wins in that it has built-in accessibility such as voiceover, talkback, etc as well as the sort of accessibility on the app options. So stanza for instance, can change colours and have larger fonts. But at no time are you aware that when you download that book, you will know that it can offer you this accessibility. The research that we've done with over 30 of these individual iPads, iFormats, iReaders, e-readers, whatever you want to call them, we've discovered that the book you particularly want may not be accessible when you download it due to copyright, DRM, or for whatever reason, the user has an experience that is delivered to them in a way that the publisher and those who have actually built the e-reader and the app have decided. The user may not necessarily be able to change the look and feel of what they have just downloaded. So what are we downloading? Well, we're downloading a mix of what we know as formats, file types you'll see something called DBT there, the Daisy Talking Book. The trouble about that is it probably should be DTB, and I think there's a mistake there on that particular slide. But what I would say about the Daisy Talking Book is that we hope it will amalgamate with the EPUB 3 to offer this navigation, to offer this accessibility. The other thing is we have a Mobi Reader, we have a PDF, we have HTML, we have iBooks particular own format, we have Kindle's own format. As a user, you don't necessarily know what any of those formats mean. When we're working with students and we talk about these formats, all they are interested in is the fact that they can actually read it in the way they want. So we need to be looking at that much more carefully when we are working with our students and our e-readers. Cost implications are huge. When we're interviewing students, asking them about their experience with e-readers, we find very few of them are using them. We find that often they might have helped Granny with their Kindle, but when we actually lend them our Kindles, they seem to find them extremely easy to work with. They can flip between books, they can actually find their PDFs on them within the libraries, we can actually help them download accessible texts onto these e-readers, but at a cost. And the cost for the e-readers is undoubtedly less than the tablets. The cheapest Kindle, £89 in Amazon when I looked yesterday. The most expensive iPad, £659 when I looked on Apple's website. Now that gives you 64 gigs of uh, memory, it gives you Wi-Fi, it gives you connectivity, it possibly gives you videos coming down at the fastest rate you could possibly want if you're lucky enough to have a good Wi-Fi connection. 
So it provides you with that flexibility that you wouldn't necessarily get on an e-reader. We need to be thinking about cost if we're going to think about this across the schools. And Apple, as we know, have been working hard to encourage schools to take on their iPad technologies because obviously once you're into the iPad, you're into iTunes, you're into Macs and you're into their libraries. And the same can be said about Kindles, you're into their library. So we need to see how we can open this all up. We need to make it easier for us to be able to download formats that we actually feel are more suitable for our students to work on these tablets and e-readers. So we've got some decisions to make. And they're not easy, and none of them are necessarily right. Just like choosing schools, choosing books, choosing anything in life, no one decision is going to be right at any particular time for any particular child. We're into a gamble here. In fact, Drinkwater even says there are issues with e-readers. He was quite depressing in his research. He happened to mention the fact that there's a lack of academic content. Well, we know that textbooks in accessible formats are one of the hardest things to find. And as we've discovered in several research projects recently, the sort of things that Load to Learn are doing, that the Accessible Resources project showed, meant that our students who needed accessible texts had to go to a specialist library, have to use specialist producers, have to find special publications, and yet they need to have the text at the same time as their peers. There is no way that we can actually help someone who needs a scientific textbook to have it within the day. It's going to take hours to change endless mathematical equations, chemistry and, say, physics functionality into a sort of linear presentation that can help a blind student understand a complex lesson. And yet, our non-visually impaired student is able to look at it, see it on the page straight away. So we have a gap. It's a gap that is not going to ever be easy to fill at all times. But electronic text does offer that option. OK, Drinkwater says that ebooks are fiddly, fragile and need charging. Well, we know that. Fiddly because some of the buttons are a bit small. Fiddly, for instance, for the Kindle, where you have a tiny keyboard and when you're searching for a book, if you're visually impaired, this is extremely difficult. Fragile. Well, OK, you reverse your car over your iPad, it's not going to last. But then if you leave your book in a puddle, it's not going to last either. So I think fragility is something that we shouldn't be too worried about. We gave out 12 iPads to some very, very, shall I say, not very caring students of technology in a particular school that I went to. We had enormous fun over 10 weeks watching them enjoying the use of this technology. Not one was smashed. 40 laptops went out to students in the Accessible Resources project. Not one laptop was damaged. I think someone else managed to break a screen of one of them, but it certainly wasn't the student that had been given the laptop. So fragility is not something that we need to be thinking about too carefully. Needs charging, yes. Needs charging with an e-reader, not such a difficulty because we know they last longer, they can do them overnight. But iPads and laptops, charging units all over the place, plugging in, uh, in the case of a laptop, uh, when you've got a lesson, not easy. The iPad that's had its video and its time recorder and its music playing long, uh, long standing is not going to work throughout the whole of a lesson if you've had it on all evening before. So you have got difficulties there with charging. But this is the worst one. This is the one that confounds us. We know that digital rights management is important. We know that having restrictive licensing is important. For publishers, we don't want copyright to disappear out of the window. But we need to find our way around some of the laws so that we can support our students in the best way possible. For those students who are dyslexic, who do not have a registered disability, who are finding it hard to download text in a format that suits their needs, we are still struggling to work to a way that will actually support them 
in the classroom at the same time as their peers. So I think this is something that we need to be looking at more carefully, but it's going to take time because publishers need to be able to support their authors, their companies and everything else. So it's not an easy option just to say that we can get rid of copyright. And in fact, sharing books is something that libraries have been looking at and lending and the rights to lending is something that is of a great concern to them at present. Drinkwater talks about environmental issues, the inability to replace a battery. Well, I think we need to be careful about this one as well, because actually very often having 3000 books on one piece of technology is pretty amazing when it comes to actually looking at the printing of those 3000 books. So I'm actually quite happy with this credential for environmental friendliness, but perhaps this is an argument that needs to be had at another time. I want to look at the positive issues. I want to say that research has shown that the benefits of e-books outweighs the disadvantages. I want to say that I've seen the excitement of children when they've picked up a piece of technology that's going to read the book back to them and they're going to see the text on that screen. And they've walked into the classroom and they've sat down with their peers and they've been reading at the same time as their peers. They've then been able to put up their hand and answer a question at the same time as their friends without being concerned about what they've read because they know what they've read is something they've at last understood. I want to say to you that for many people with print disabilities, e-books offer access options impossible with ordinary print. Thank you. Thank you for watching. For more tutorials or information about Load to Learn, please visit loadtolearn.org.uk or contact us on 0300 303 8313. Copyright 2012 Dyslexia Action in R&IB. Licensed under the Creative Commons license by attribution for non-commercial purposes and shared alike.